Hyatt's Dwyer, always, 1776.com, also digitalassetlife.com. Today's October the 8th, 2024. Let's talk about a bet I like on the board. It's a political bet. I've mentioned it before. I believe now it's even more compelling. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, the bet that I like, and it's uh, an underdog play right now, is the GOP to win the popular vote. Believe it or not, right now you're getting that at sites like bovada.lv at a plus 275. Let me repeat that, a plus 275. Now let me further add that, you know, I don't plan a vote for the Democrats or the Republicans in the presidential race, right? I don't. Um, I'm in it to make money, really couldn't care less what's politically correct, right? This to me is just an opportunity. But let's give the backdrop to it, right? Right now, folks are focusing on national polls and they matter for this bet. That show Kamala Harris with between a one and a three percentage point lead. Now, I want people to understand, and old-timers know this, that in presidential elections, things will often break in the last 10 days before the election, right? Jimmy Carter was beating Ronald Reagan in 1980. They had one debate. Reagan asked the question, are you better off than you were four years ago? Um, things broke. People want consensus. You have a lot of voters who are on the fence who will tell the pollsters one thing and then do another when they sense that the political mood in the country has changed. You also have other voters who will talk to pollsters and then will ask themselves, wow, it's windy outside. My neighbor doesn't agree with me. How strongly do I believe in the pick that I had that I discussed with the pollster? And you'll find many, many people in certain elections staying home. Let me also say, too, that what I'm about to say has nothing to do with intelligence. Right? It really speaks to presentation. I believe you have some extremely bright people who just don't come across well when questioned or in stressful situations, right? Understand, Jimmy Carter, one-termer, was Phi Beta Kappa. Understand the folksy Harry S. Truman Right, who was supposed to lose to Thomas Dewey. That election was a bit of a miracle. Right, Truman wins several states, barely. Harry S. Truman was Phi Beta Kappa. Let me say, if you've studied the Kennedy assassination, it's intriguing that Gerald Ford, who never came across authoritatively in public, who was played on the old Saturday Night Live by Chevy Chase, who kept falling downstairs and what have you in the skits. But if you've studied the Kennedy assassination, you know Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission. It's Gerald Ford who changes the trajectory of the bullet. Then, of course, Gerald Ford, we come to find out, had a relationship with certain members of the intelligence community. Gerald Ford is one of the very few who became vice president without a vote of the people. Right? Look him up. Right? Gerald Ford, of course, is the person who allowed uh, 
private ownership of gold in the United States, right, for the first time since the FDR administration. You know, Ford's brief time as president is actually uh, a momentous administration, right? And, of course, Ronald Reagan in 1980 offered the former president the vice presidency. But Gerald Ford had preconditions, and if you believe the Reagan people, Gerald Ford wanted a co-presidency, right? Reagan had, <laughs> Reagan had the nomination. He had won the nomination, but Gerald Ford wanted the power, right? Understand behind the scenes, Gerald Ford was someone else. In public, he just couldn't present himself the right way. Now, let me just say, in the 70s, and keep in mind, the 70s are, you know, the era of Watergate. The 70s open. We're still in Vietnam. Um, there was still an outcry over the Kennedy assassination in 63 to the point where you had the church committee, you had Congress investigating the Kennedy assassination. The press did not trust the government back then. You had a completely different dynamic that you just don't have now, right? People weren't trying to be friends, at least not people in the press, with Richard Nixon. Right now, when I was a kid growing up, just to understand that you knew that if someone was being interviewed by Mike Wallace, right, of CBS, you understood that that interviewee was going to be put through hell. You understood that Mike Wallace was going to show up prepared for the interview. You understood that Mike Wallace was going to ask hard questions. Wallace wasn't interested in being friends with power, right? Mike Wallace wanted to question power, Right? People were cynical in the 1970s. Right, This is the decade of gas rationing and what have you. Well, I heard that Kamala Harris was going to be interviewed on CBS, right, on 60 Minutes. Ironically, Mike Wallace used to be involved with 60 Minutes. Now, I didn't piece it together until I actually saw tape of the interview. That's when I realized that she was being interviewed by Bill Whitaker. Now, if you follow Bill Whitaker, you understand that he is a Mike Wallace type interviewer, right? I have to be blunt here. I wouldn't want to be interviewed by Bill Whitaker. If I were advising a presidential candidate and I heard that CBS wanted to interview my candidate, I would have to ask, well, who at CBS is going to interview our candidate? If it's Bill Whitaker, I'd say no. Right? Bad publicity is not worth it when you're running for president. You understand you need a thoroughbred. You need not a Jimmy Carter, not a Harry Truman. You actually need a Bill Clinton or a Barack Obama. If you're going to sit down and deal with Bill Whitaker, right? I wouldn't want Reagan interviewed by Bill Whitaker because Reagan was better with advisors nearby. You need the person who's encyclopedic. By the way, Bill Clinton, Phi Beta Kappa. You need the person who's encyclopedic, but also well presented. You need the person who can shorten their views down to slogans that people remember. Right? Bill Clinton, mend it. Don't end it. Right? Johnny Cochran, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. You also need someone who's interactive. In other words, a question's asked. Right? What were you doing last Wednesday? You want the person who can actually answer the question. Right? You, you don't want the person who comes in rehearsed with one-liners. You want the person who's actually in the conversation, who's actually there to provide information, 
who shows up to the interview wanting to answer the tough questions that everyone's thinking about, trusting their instincts. Now, let me just say, Bill Whitaker insists on answers. If he asks you a question, and he's soft-spoken, he has a young Sean Connery's gift of clothing, right? His clothes just fit him better than everyone else. He has a disposition that's calm, that's laid back. He's a little bit different than Mike Wallace, because Mike Wallace was a little bit confrontational. If you think Wallace was good in the 70s, go back and look at Wallace in the 60s. There were a lot of videos of him interviewing people like Malcolm X, who held his own. Right? In fact, you needed Malcolm X here, not Kamala Harris. So this interview was a complete disaster. Right? Kamala doesn't come across like a Bill Clinton or a Barack Obama does. When Barack Obama, in interviews, would start talking about how we needed practical solutions, he could actually talk with you about the impractical solutions being proposed by his political opponents. And he was accurate. He could actually talk with the interviewer about the difference between his view and the view he didn't disagree with. So by the time he got to the line where he talked about practical solutions, you were thinking, hey, you know, this isn't ideological. And by the way, that was the problem with Barack Obama, <laughs> right? This isn't ideological. This is practical. This guy's a problem solver. Right? John F. Kennedy. They actually have here online on YouTube some of his press conferences. He's dismissing reporters' questions with one-liners. But yet, he's informative. That's what you needed here. So understand the opportunity that Kamala Harris had. Donald Trump, wise move, refused to be on the show. Right? Trump just has too much going on. Right? Rape conviction, lawfare. Um, some of us, let me raise my hand, don't like the idea of a border wall. Uh, some of us, let me raise my hand, don't like the idea of tariffs. Right? So just understand, Trump isn't there. It's Kamala's show. Bill Whitaker picks some subjects. Let's just talk about just some of them. Right? Whitaker asks her about foreign policy. What is she going to do to prevent the escalation of a war in the Middle East? Now, I've seen people handle questions like this in many ways. Right? I've seen really astute politicians talk about how they're limited in what they can say because of relationships with allies as well as a need for some confidentiality in trying to protect American interests and um, American lives. Right? I've, seen, I've seen that before. But even those politicians will then talk about how steps can be made how um, they can reach out to certain key players. They don't even have to identify the key players. Right? How they've received assurances from allies. Right? Whether or not the ally is reliable, it would have helped to have some reference to, you know, communication uh, between the United States and some of the players that would assuage viewers into thinking that we're in control of this situation. That's not the kind of answer that Kamala Harris gave. Right? Kamala seemed to show up with a list of 
statements that worked for other candidates in the past. Right, Kamala at times seems surprised by Whitaker's questions as if she showed up and did not expect to actually be challenged on the border. Well, understand, I thought Kamala did a terrible job talking about the steps she would take in terms of foreign policy, in terms of the situation in the Middle East. On the border, Whitaker asked the question, you thought Kamala would jump on the question. This is my opportunity to address the border. Right, Whitaker pointed out that the crossings have increased by three or four times um, since Biden-Harris took office. And here again, Kamala's response was non-responsive to the point where Whitaker had to repeat the question. And of course, Kamala kept talking. Right, she quite frankly would have been better off saying we could have done some things better, right? We've all seen the astute politician who will talk in the passive tense and will say things like mistakes were made, right? But those weren't the kind of answers Kamala had on her list. That wasn't what she was prepared for. Let's just say it didn't work. On inflation, now let me just say it's stunning that any politician would blame supermarkets with less than 3% profit margins for inflation, right? Think about the players in the grocery space. Some of the shrewdest retailers in the country, Walmart, Amazon, right? You know, Amazon seems more into brand extension than anything else, don't they? You don't even get the feeling they're making big money off their supermarkets. You get the feeling that they really just want their name in the news so they can make money off higher margin parts of their business, like cloud computing. And so understand, it's, it's absurd to say we're going to fight inflation by setting up a government agency that's going to look for price gouging by retailers making 3% and less margins. Well, it's amazing. You would have thought that at this late stage in the campaign, the candidates would come clean. They would be focused. They would realize that that earlier speech didn't work. Right? That people understand that there's a correlation between money printing by the government, spending by the government, demands on capital by the government, and rising prices. Right? You don't need to be an econ major to understand that the inflation government is responsible for at least part of it. Well, folks, here again, Kamala was unprepared for the question. She was my senator, right? She was the attorney general for the state of California. I'm sure Kamala is uh, very sharp. My ex-wife and Kamala Harris didn't know each other, but they were in the same sorority, right? You know, looking at Kamala's past, I know she's accomplished, right? She's our current vice president. But like Jimmy Carter, interviews are not a forum that she excels in. You can't put her in with a Bill Whitaker. Folks, you just can't. Right? I mean, you know, I believe Richard Nixon dodged interviews with Mike Wallace. Right? You don't want to put Kamala Harris in with a Mike Wallace type guy. Whitaker is just too focused. He's too cerebral. So let me just say, the interesting part 
Give me one moment. The interesting part for me in the interview was when Whitaker talked about the idea that Kamala Harris was appointed the nominee and did not actually participate in the primary, right? Um, people in states spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, you know, preparing to vote. And then they did not vote for Kamala, who was not on the ballot at that time. And then, of course, Kamala is appointed. You don't have an open convention. In other words, there's no party get together where people actually discuss platforms, where candidates actually have to take positions. And the party then openly discusses, do we want a price gouging commission to investigate supermarkets? Right? Do we want a candidate who owns a gun but has been in support of what they call mandatory buybacks where the government can take your gun right folks the democratic party didn't have an open convention candidates at the convention didn't have to strongly identify with certain issues right i myself might have been interested in voting for kamala if she was for free trade and not tariffs I could have thought, okay, that would have been interesting, right? If Kamala would have given some argument as to why we shouldn't have a border wall and perhaps we should have an expanded work visa program for people entering the United States, I would have been interested in that. Instead, we got handed Kamala, and we're trying to figure out her positions. So, Bill Whitaker, as only a skilled interviewer can, says to her, you know, people feel like they don't know you because you've changed your positions on. And then he starts talking about that, right? Fracking. Now, of course, she's for a border wall, right? He goes down a list. It's clinical. Now, it would have been spectacular. It would have gotten her votes if rather than just give some bland answer about how she's been going around the country talking to people, right? Understand, many of us, I'm raising my hand here, want a candidate who isn't just blindly following popular sentiment. Sometimes we need to hear hard news, right? If on fracking, Kamala had information where she talked about the job losses that would result from her prior position where she opposed fracking Right? She should own what she believed in. Right? If she talked about job losses and then she talked about how tenuous the economy was, particularly in places like Pennsylvania, where fracking employs a lot of people. And then if she said, look, you know, I don't like the environmental fallout from fracking. But I have had to evolve because our economy is going through a hard time. I'm not saying I'd agree with her. But what I am saying is that's the kind of response. That's the kind of thought process that I want a major presidential candidate to have. Right? I would have sat there and I would have thought, you know what? She has a backbone. She is principled. She's trying to answer the question. Right, she then could have pivoted to immigration. She could have pivoted to whatever she wanted. She could have controlled that interview because Bill Whitaker was asking compound questions. Right, she could have literally talked for 10, 15 minutes. She could have given you her thought process. 
you know, um, with regard to the gun too, right? Whitaker says, what kind of gun do you own? Then he follows it up with, when did you get the gun? It would have been spectacular, and hindsight's 100%. But it would have been spectacular if she would have said, look, I know there's concern over my views on guns. Let's talk about it. There was a time when I was for mandatory buybacks, or maybe she could have said, I'm for mandatory buybacks right now. And then she could have cited violent crime stats. She could have even gone the anecdote route and talked about specific instances where gun regulation could have saved lives. She didn't even do that. So understand, this interview was an unmitigated disaster. People's knowledge of it is going to be slow in forming. It's going to take some time for folks to ask themselves, given this interview, how well do I know this candidate? And of course, the world's hot right now. Right? You have France giving military weapons to Ukraine. They're involved in a war with Russia. Of course, you have the situation in the Middle East. Now Lebanon is involved. Uh, a lot's going on. Um, the United States, we seem to be acting passively. Just understand that in these uncertain times, Right Within the last 24 hours, you've had um, a major equity crash in Asia. Right In these uncertain times where the price of gold is skyrocketing, where many people are concerned about whether or not we're in a recession. I just heard a Stephanie Pombroy interview where she just flatly said, we're in a recession. In these uncertain times, a candidate who can't answer questions about major issues like what's happening in the Middle East on an interview on a national network, right? One of the long running news shows on that network. I think people are going to take a step back. Right, Kamala Harris is ahead right now in the popular vote. But understand, Trump's a strong finisher. Right, Trump is the kind of candidate who people don't want to admit that they're actually going to vote for. That's the history in 2016. That's the history in 2020. He loses the race in 2020. But understand, he's close in several states, closer than the polls suggested going into the election. So what I want people to do is to look at polls that have Kamala ahead by one to three points and just realize to themselves, I have a chance at a plus 275, 2.75 times the money I bet. If the GOP can just close that gap. Understand too, Kamala's from California, right? Where I live, right? I love California. It's my favorite state. Not here to diss California. But you and I know the way these elections roll out. I know they have a lot of safeguards in place, right? I know they say, hey, don't tell us who's ahead in certain states. But by the time California votes, you're going to know, aren't you, who won Pennsylvania? You're going to know, aren't you, who won Michigan? There's a chance that by the time California votes, this election will be a done deal. You'll already know who has won. Right? And so understand, to win this prop, it's not whether Trump wins the election. No, this prop is the popular vote, which Republicans haven't won for several election cycles. Right? For you to have a chance to win this, Trump would have to win in states like Georgia, 
Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, where he's leading now, Michigan, where it's a photo finish right now. Right? If he's ahead in those states, Kamala Harris's margin of victory, she'll win the state of California, but her margin of victory might not be what people think. Let me also point out, too, that the times are changing. In Silicon Valley, you actually have venture capital firms, Andreessen Horowitz, for example, where people are now openly, openly supporting, if not Trump, well, non-Democrats, right? You even have Zuckerberg of Meta, you know, expressing remorse over agreeing to some press censorship in a prior election and who is openly calling Donald Trump a badass, right? My point to you is in that kind of environment, I'm just telling you, if Trump wins Pennsylvania, a lot of dominoes are going to fall and they're not going to fall in Kamala Harris's direction. So let me say this. I know I have a very diverse group here uh, that watch my videos on YouTube. Great. I'm thrilled. Right? I love diversity. Let me just say this. Um, read the earlier comments to videos where I've talked about the chance that the GOP could actually win the popular vote. Right? You're going to notice a lot of people saying, Dwyer, you're crazy. Uh, I don't see it. You're selling Harris short. Right, folks? Now we've seen Harris in interviews. Right? Tell us how you believe all of this is trending in the comment section of this video. In other words, I thought Harris was going to face an uphill battle. Keep in mind, Harris wasn't that popular as vice president. We forget just six months ago. I tried to watch parts of the Democratic convention. There just was not enough meat on the bone there. I was hoping to actually hear, you know, people say, hey, let's not have tariffs. You know, I was hoping to have a clear choice that differed from the agenda Donald Trump was running on. And I didn't. It got so laughable that now I'm hearing that Dems support a border wall. I have a longtime liberal friend. This guy, knowing that I'm an immigrant, can't even look me in the face now that he's supporting a border wall. Right? Folks, I'm just telling you, um, the more word of this Bill Whitaker interview that gets out, the more turmoil that we hear about overseas, the more economic uncertainty, right? They just cut rates. I'm telling you, there's a good crowd out there that's asking the question why, right? With all this debt, shouldn't we have higher interest rates? just to discourage further debt formation, even if it costs us more to service our own debt. Right? And understand, things are trending in the wrong direction. Right? Harris, who's already giving you $6,000 for a new kid, and who wants to give you $25,000 if you're a first-time homebuyer, and wants to give you $50,000 if you're starting a small business, Right now is talking about Medicare expansion. Right, let's think it through. If there are heightened concerns on debt, I'm just telling you the last 10 days before the election, don't be surprised if a lot of people suddenly start supporting one candidate or the other. I get the feeling the candidate they're going to support is Donald Trump. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. And let me also say this too. I believe very much in free speech, right? Very much. 
Um, if you disagree with me, that's fine. Please feel free to leave those comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by. Again, it's GOP to win the popular vote. You're getting it at a plus 275. And it is roughly a month before the election, October the 8th, 2024. Thanks for stopping by.